All right, over in Joshua chapter 6. Now, we know Joshua lived by faith. Um, think about Joshua. Let's just kind of give his little history here. Joshua was one of the two people who, did, who, who were over 20 years old at the time of the rebellion. How many of you know what the rebellion is? When they went up to the Red Sea and they sent in the, two, the, the, the spies, the 12 spies, and they came back, and, and the Bible says this over in Numbers. It says, and they gave an evil report. Ten of the spies gave an evil report. They, they said, yeah, the land's got the, the, the fruit, like you said. It flows with milk and honey. You know, here's the grapes from it. You know, one cluster of grapes on a staff between two men. And they went on and on and talking about how great it was. Yet, nevertheless, I tell you what, watch out for nevertheless is to keep you out of the plan of God. The giants, the people be strong there. The giants are in the land. People from Anak are in the land, you know, and they're, they're, they've got walled cities. And, you know, and, and we were in their sight, we, we were in our sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. <coughs> now Joshua and Caleb stilled the people and said, let us go up at once to possess the land, for we are well able. So this is the kind of person Joshua was. We know he was over 20, because everybody that was under the age of 20 at that time died in the wilderness and didn't get to go in. All right? And, uh, and, but, but Joshua and Caleb, they were the only two because they were, uh, they were strong in faith. They didn't, they didn't murmur. They didn't complain. They didn't whine about how big the giants were. As a matter of fact, they, they were ready to go take them out. They wanted, they wanted some giant kicking butt m uh, moments of their life. All right? And Caleb got it because he went and took his mountain at 85. You know, as a matter of fact, I think I believe Joshua was about um, uh, old. He may have been about 40 at this time. I mean, we know Caleb was 45 at the time because he was 85 when he went and got his mountain, all right? So here in, in Joshua, so this is Joshua. So Joshua chapter 6, verse 2. And, um, and the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given unto thine hand Jericho and, there, and the king thereof and the mighty men of the city, and you shall compass the city, all you men of war, and go round about the city once. Thou shalt do for six days. And the seven priests shall bear the, uh, before the ark the seven trumpets of seven, uh, ram's horns. And the seventh day you can pass the city seven times. And the priests shall blow the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when you make the long blast with the ram's horn and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout. And the wall of the city shall fall down flat. Hallelujah. Uh, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. And Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said unto them, Take the ark of the covenant and let the seven priests bear seven trumpets of rams. And he said unto the people, Pass on and compass the city and let him that is armed pass on before the ark of the covenant. Verse 16. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. Verse 20. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat or under it, and actually archaeology has found that the walls went down. The, the, the top of the walls are level with the, bottom, with the foot of the city. They didn't fall over. They went down. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And every man took straight before him, and they took the city. Now, um, you know, we, how many of you have ever seen the Hollywood movies? The walls are falling, they're dodging, the big boulders are running in. Now, God just pushed the walls down, they ran right over top of them. Don't you know the guys guarding the walls and up there on the top of the walls? I mean, they're, they're sitting here ready to do something, and all of a sudden they're on an the elevator. Mm. That had to be disconcerting. Amen. That had to be kind of, you know, you're, you're, you're up here. Man, I got a great, I got him, I got him. Mm. And by the time he realized what happened, here they come right up face to face with him. That's not a good deal. I mean, you might get one guy, but the next guy will cut your head off. Amen? Well, that's the thing, you know, so. <clears throat> I, just, can you imagine that? Well, see, God's not a bad general. If he had just knocked the walls over, then, then the people of Jericho, the, 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 the Israelites would have had to dodge all the, all the rubble. They would have had to, they, and every time they would step over rubble and watch out for the rubble, they would have been a target. God just pushed the wall down, and then, you know, of course, that probably shook up the, uh, the people in Jericho. It would shake me up. I'd never seen the elevator before. And all of a sudden, I was on one. Uh, and then here comes a whole army that, you know, has been out there walking around for six days, and I've been, I've been making fun of them for six days. Look at those idiots out there walking around. Now, Jericho is the uh, antithesis to the statement, uh, insanity is, the, uh, is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. See, people use that all the time. You keep doing the same thing over and over again and, and, and expecting a different result, that's insanity. They walked around the wall and walked, walked around the wall and walked around the wall and walked around the wall and walked around the wall. Amen. See, obedience to God, even if it's doing the same thing over and over again, is not insanity. 
Amen. I said, Amen. I mean, the Israelites got up every day and went outside and ate manna. Until they started complaining. You know, I tell you, you know, it's, it's not good to complain against God. Don't need to have a murmuring mouth against God. Don't need to have a murmuring mouth anyway, but one against God is not wise. It's going to get you in trouble. Hello? I mean, listen, the devil's not your answer. And you start complaining against God, who is your answer, you're going to get yourself in trouble. So we don't want to complain against God, do we? So here we have a man of faith. How many would agree that Joshua's a man of faith? I mean, Joshua, Joshua said, you know, he said, you know, let's go take the land. He got to live. He took over Israel. He let them in on dry ground. Amen. He's the one that let them in. They were killing, uh, kick, uh, kicking giants out everywhere. Got to Jericho. There's a walled city there. You know, you can look at a walled city and go, oh, man, we're in trouble. Now, have, how many of you have ever seen castles? Ever been anywhere you've actually seen castles? Okay. Now, you know, if you see them in pictures or whatever, that's, that, that's one thing. To actually go to them and stand up in the turrets or on the walls and stuff, it's a whole different perspective. And um, I, I know that I've been in, I've been in uh, Ab Ab Abila, Abilia, depending on how you pronounce it, in Spain. And it's, one, it's, a, it's a national uh, world hist heritage site. It's walled. It's a walled city there. And the walls are, you know, they're still standing from the 13 or 1400s or something. I mean, and it's just, you walk up and they're, 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 I mean, you just look way down. There's a, that wall's running down there. And you've got to think, now, we don't have, you didn't have helicopters. Hello? You didn't have drones. You didn't have any of the modern technology. They had to get over that wall by climbing with a rope and putting uh, some kind of latch ladder together. And you were sitting up. So walls were ominous. I've been in, you know, in Estonia and Tallinn, the, the old town of Tallinn, and their, their turrets from, from the 800s or 900s or that era are still standing. The, probably 40 or 50% of the wall is still up. That's how strong those walls are. And they, were, they weren't short. They were 30, 40 feet high, you know? I mean, it's just, you kind of look at that, and you go, how, how are you going to do that? You kind of think, children of Israel show up, and here's the walls of Jericho. Wide enough to ride, uh, was it two or four or six, whatever it was, but on top of the wall. That's a thick wall. It's wider, at least as wide as this room. There, they're riding chariots around the wall. Wow. And you show up, but here's a man of faith who gets a word from God. See, when you live by faith, you hear from heaven. What you're going to hear from heaven is faith. Now, when you don't live by faith, you're going to get stuff from the devil that's going to be faithless. You're going to get hee-haw songs. Can somebody cut the air conditioner back? I mean, it's not that hot. <laughs> it's a little warmer today. It was in the mid, low, low mid-70s. My goodness, I'm looking, at, I was looking, I'm, I was looking for the Chick-fil-A cows to see if they were hung up here, in here for, for dinner. Hallelujah. But when we live by faith, then, then we have a mindset of faith, we hear faith, we act faith, we do faith, and we get faith, supernatural faith results. Here Joshua, who lived by faith, and lived, he was in faith back when he was a young man, and, and, and said, let's go take the giants. He gets over here when he's older, uh, up near 80 or so, and he's going in, they're going to show up at Jericho. He's not weak in faith, he's strong in faith. He said, let's take the city, we're going to take the city, here's what we're going to do, God give me a word, we're going to walk around the city. <clears throat> every day. And I'm not sure that he went out and told the people what they were going to do. He just said, let's you get out tomorrow morning and go walk around the city. Shut up. Don't say anything. Now, why did God tell them to have not say anything? Anybody got an idea? Because you get a bunch of folk together and get into doing something in obedience to what God said do, and, and, and it's just like a church. It don't matter how big or how small the church is, you start telling the church, here's what we need to do, and you give them enough time, and they're going to start talking about it. Well, I think Pastor Ed's crazy. I think it's the best idea I've ever heard, ever heard of since peanut butter and sliced bread. Get, get them going long enough, and they'll start talking about themselves and mess everything up. So God said, shut up. Don't say anything. You can't talk. <clears throat> Why can't you? Make, you know, and you may not say anything the first day or the second day, but probably about day three, Leroy would have said to Ethel, what in the world do you think Joshua was doing? I don't know, but I'm tired of walking around and saying, I'm ready to fight. I was ready to fight on Monday. Here it is mid-Wednesday. You know, and I'm getting a little tired of walking around this stupid wall, having them wait, uh, mock us and stuff. And, you know, say stuff out there. We don't know what they're saying. I don't know what language they're speaking, but they're mocking us. You know? I mean, they're, they're, you know, here we are on day three, walking around the wall. See, you get that stuff going on, and they start talking, and they'll mess it up. So God said, just have them be quiet. Or shut up. Amen? Okay? Or, or we want to say it in French, femme de bouche. Just shut up in French. <laughs> Sounds prettier, doesn't it? Doesn't it just sound pretty? Family bush. 
But they, oh, that's so pretty. I said, shut up. <laughs> you know, to a vet. That means you're stupid. Well, I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> <coughs> Hallelujah. And so they, they get there, they start walking around. Joshua, but see, Joshua's a man of faith. He knows what the outcome is going to be. Because why? Because God gave him a word. Has God given you a word? Has God shared things with your life? Paul wrote to Timothy in one place and said this, fight a good warfare with the prophecies that went before you. He had words from God. He said, you could take that from God and you could go fight battles and win, glory to God. See, God wants us to win. Point it, take your finger and point at you and say, God wants me to win. And I win by faith. How do you know? This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Our victory is found in our faith. Can you say amen? And so Joshua took the city with the people of Israel because they, they what? They lived by faith. They acted in faith. They did faith because it was a lifestyle. <clears throat> now remember, this isn't the same bunch who got, to the, got, got over uh, to the River Jordan and started whining about the giants. They all died. And I'll bet you that they had rehearsed day after day after day. Look, then when you get a chance to go over, shut up. If the man of God says we're going over, say yes, sir. Because here, while we've been walking around in this stupid wilderness, eating manna, got quail running out our nose, and, and all this stuff, we haven't had a place to live. We've just been wondrous for 40 years because we didn't believe. And so when they got there, you didn't hear one complaint about going over. Did you? When they said, when they said we're, you know, get the Ark of the Covenant, we're going over, that not, n nobody complained. They were ready. They were cock locked and ready to rock. Amen? Hallelujah. And so Joshua was a man of faith. Miracles were in his life. Miracles were in his, in, in, in his leadership. And it, and it caused the, the people to follow him to have the same thing. God wants you to live that way. God wants you to live in a place where you say, yes, Lord. Where you take, his word, take him at his word. You live that way. You live in an expectancy. You live in an attitude of faith. You live in a mindset of faith. So that when, when listen, let me back up here. The problem with not living with a mindset and an attitude and a lifestyle of faith is it's hard to go get faith in the middle of the crisis. Because there's so much pressure coming. And you say you couldn't, it's hard. It's just easier that when the crisis shows up, you already know what to do. Now think about this. Um, anybody, in the, ever, anybody here ever been in the military? Okay, all right, David, all right. When you're training the soldiers, now I, I don't understand our military, they, they don't even let them have guns on the bases, okay? They're, they're, they're trained soldiers. You know, if we get crazies on the base, they could all kill them, take them out. They would have one dead nut instead of 12 dead people. Another story, another day, all right? But um, one of the things they, they do for combat soldiers is they'll put them in these big rooms, they'll shut, give them their weapon, They'll shut the doors where there's no light. They'll put gas in there. And they've got to, in, just, in, in a certain amount, a minute or two minutes or whatever it is, whatever the, whatever the time frame is, they have to get their gas mask on. They have to tear their weapon down. They have to put it back together and have it ready to shoot. Why? Because if you're in the middle of a battle and you don't know how to do that, you're toast. I mean, if your gun jams in the middle of a battle and you've got to tear it down and put it back together and you've got to do it in, in 30, 40, 50 seconds, whatever, minute, whatever, the guy next to you doesn't have time to put his weapon down and to help you fix your gun, your weapon. Can't call it a gun anymore. You can't even carry little keychain guns to church school. They'll expel you on a zero pop. You can't bite your Pop-Tart to the shape of a gun. They'll suspend you. Huh? You can't use your finger either because, you know, you might accidentally shoot somebody with that. They had... They had four kids up in Virginia or somewhere recently. They got, they got suspended for the rest of the year for, for playing um, uh, airsoft on their own property because it was 75 feet from this bus stop. Airsoft. Yeah, anyway, the loons are, are run the, the insane asylum. Hallelujah. Glory. Where was I before I got off on that? That wasn't part of my sermon. Huh? You're just laughing. Does not even... Does any, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, be prepared. <clears throat> because in the middle of the battle, you don't have time. You're, 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 you're set up to be a casualty. You might figure it out, and you might not, but you weren't prepared in that midst of that battle 
to tear that weapon down, put it back together, bullets flying all around you. You, you, know, you know, the, the second lieutenant says, all right, move to the right, guys. We've got to get over here. And you're down here with your gun half taken apart. You know what? You're not prepared. So in, so, in, so in training, they do this all the time. They get up and they tear that gun down and put it back together in case it jams, because it could jam, and they do jam. And they got to be able to di disassemble that, that, that weapon, put it back together, and have it ready for battle, because when you're in the midst of battle, you don't have time to go get the instructions. Uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm going to get a smartphone. I'm going to go on Google and do a Google search on tearing my weapon down. Yeah, light up the whole place while you're doing it, pal. You know, just, just saying, he had us right here with a mortar. You know, no. And see, the lifestyle of faith is the same thing. You need to be trained, and you need to be ready. You need to be putting the things in. You need to be ready. So when the battle shows up, you know what to do. You're not sitting there trying to figure out what to do. You already know what to do. You already know what to say. What if I don't have a scripture for you? See, here's the thing. When you live the lifestyle of faith, you develop the belief in God's Word. You develop, you develop that relationship with God. You develop that understanding of God. You develop a place of, of faith in that if God said it, it's so, because you're proving the other things out. And maybe you get to a place you need a different scripture that you don't have, but you see the lifestyle's already set up. And it's just like getting another cartridge and plugging it in. Oh, okay, I, I didn't know that scripture was there. Now I know it because, but because I know my father and because I've been developing my faith and because I'm walking him with relationship that when I get this scripture, I don't have to meditate on that for six months. I already know how faith works and he said that, so it's so. You understand? <clears throat> now when you start now, you got to do it over and over and over again. But see, if you know, say, say you run out, I need a cartridge. Somebody throws you another cartridge, it's not yours. If it's the gun, you know what to do with it. It's just a different cartridge. And see, you get to that walk with God, and you live with God, and you, you commune with Him. And you fellowship with Him. And you come to that place and that relationship so that when, <clears throat> maybe when you first started out this journey, you had to meditate on something for weeks and weeks and weeks or whatever until it became real to you. But now, somebody can give you a scripture, you go, yeah, God said that, my father said that, that's so. And suddenly, instead of taking a period of time, it's just plugging in and adding in to the already developed lifestyle of faith. And you can act on it right then. Because you're living that way. You know God said that. My father said that. Amen. See, we want to meditate in the Word. We want to feed on the Word. And these, let me say something. When you're not in the battle, it's a good time to be, it's a good time to be meditating and refreshing yourself, getting yourself ready. Why? Because Ephesians chapter 6, run over there real quick. I'm after one verse here. That's what I'm mainly after. The lifestyle of faith, the mindset of faith. Ephesians 6, verse 10, we know this whole passage, but we're just going to, we're, finally, my brother, be, verse 10, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, why? That you may be able to withstand in the evil day, 6, 10, and 11. That you may be able to stand in the evil day. Now, let me say something. Not every day of your life is going to be the evil day. As a matter of fact, the majority days of your life are not going to be the evil day. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the wiles of the... Uh, sorry. Where is it? Where is it? Verse 13, I'm sorry. Wherefore, take on you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. There we go. Sorry, I, I, I kind of just put two verses together. It's in there, just two verses down. I ran off and stopped reading. Just <laughs> you may have to understand when, in the evil day, verse 13 says evil day. God wants you prepared to be able to stand in the evil day. And, and then it goes on and says, have you done all to stand, stand therefore? Um, <clears throat> an early J.B. Phillips translation, when, uh, when, uh, most people don't know this, J.B. Phillips did about two or three revisions to his original. When he did his first one, he just did it kind of as a, it's more of a commentary than a translation. He wrote it, but, you know, it wasn't for, for, for quoting as scriptural reference, so to speak. People started using it. 
So he went back and cleaned it up a little bit and made sure he was more accurate with the Greek instead of looser as, as he was. But one of the earlier versions of it says this, and having done all, the, uh, it says this, having done all the stand, remain on the battlefield ready to do battle again. <coughs> so, let's look at this. He says that we're to have, we're to have the armor of God on, and that we may be able to withstand in the, and put it on the whole armor so we may be able to withstand in the evil day. Meaning there are going to be days that come that are evil. Not every day is the evil day. As a matter of fact, this way this is stated kind of gives me the idea that they come at random seasons. When I say random, Satan just doesn't sit around and, and bombard you 24-7 the whole time you're saved. A lot of stuff we credit the devil with is just simply our flesh. You know when Geraldine, Flip Wilson's alter ego said, The devil made me do it, honey! How many ever saw you used to watch the Flip Wilson show? <laughs> yeah. uh, Geraldine Flip's alter ego is Geraldine. Tyler Perry's alter ego is Medea. Anyway, that's, that's enough said. I mean, you don't, need, you don't, don't ever quote Medea when she quotes the Bible. Okay? Because the St. Louis Arch came by, not Noah's Ark. <laughs> hallelujah. And rescued Jonah and so I, you know, Hallelujah. Anybody ever seen Tyler Perry's Medea? Oh, my, 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 my. I could just clip out the Medea scenes and just sit around and laugh for six weeks. Hallelujah. Amen. What I do like about it is usually he has, the, he has a biblical theme answer to all the stuff that's going on in his movies. You know, it's just that's how he does it. <clears throat> anyway, where was it before I talked about Medea? Flip Wilson, the, de the devil maybe. The devil can't make you do it. And so a lot of times we're talking about the devil being after, the devil's doing this, the devil, and that's your flesh. Honey, if, they, if you think your flesh is the evil day, you, got, you, got to, you, got to, you better get ready. You need to get back in there and get your armor on. You need to be feeding on the Word of God. Because your flesh is just something you can put down on a daily basis just by saying, I keep my body under. I buffet my body. I keep it under. Lest when I run my race, I should be found. You know, Paul, Paul didn't want to be found uh, shipwrecked. He didn't want to be found off track. By, just listen, not by the devil, by his flesh. But a lot of stuff people do is just their flesh. and ain't the devil making them do it. They, you know, no, no demon spirit came in and overcame them. They just couldn't help themselves. Just their flesh. Now, the Word of God teaches us that to put on the armor of God because there is going to be seasons or times an evil day shows up. Now, the military, that's a good, I saw it just a good example, trains. The night that, uh, uh, last week on Tuesday, uh, one of Jesse's high school friends was coming back from Afghanistan, his second, his second tour. He had an Iraq, uh, an Iraq tour and an Afghanistan tour. And he had just got back out of Afghanistan. They'd been up in a pretty hot zone for a while. And um, his, he had a 12-bin group he was in. And they came back with the, the 109th or something uh, out of Fort Bragg. And, um, and so they were, they, were, they, were, they were attached to them on the return trip. They weren't part of that group. They were, they were attached. So we went there to, um, we went there to, to he, she, he went her to come take pictures of the family greeting and stuff. So she went and took a bunch of pictures and stuff because she's a photographer and, and everything. Um, you know what? Those guys, the, and that night, that night at Fort Bragg, said, now you can't go out on the flight line and take pictures because they're doing maneuvers. They were up in the air, and guys were jumping out of planes and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And they were, you know, they're, they're, they're funny about that. They don't want pictures taken of them, what they're doing. I don't know why. No, you don't want, you don't want the enemy to get it. You remember, how many ever saw the movie The Green Berets with John Wayne? All right? You know, was it Fort Bragg and all that stuff? Guess what? It wasn't even filmed at Fort Bragg. I told one of the, one of the, the captain there, he was talking about, you know, about that. I said, yeah, just like the Green Berets. They said they said it was Fort Bragg, but it's an army base and, and a helicopter army base down in Alabama. So when it hit the movie theater, the Russians would be confused about where the layout of the base was. He he laughed and said, "Not many people know that." <laughs> and it was really true. They did not film the movie at Fort Bragg. They put the Fort Bragg sign up and then filmed the movie in Alabama, the, the base part, because they didn't want anybody to know where that. They didn't want to know where it was. They didn't want the Russians to know. All right. Well, anyway, all that's being said. But they're doing maneuvers. What, what are they out there flying around in the middle of the night in, 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 in September in America doing maneuvers for? They're training for the evil day. They're training for the day when they have to actually put that into force and operation in a combat situation. They're making preparation ahead of time. 
And so the word of God says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. So in other words, there are going to be times you're going to have to put all that stuff in operation, but it's not a daily basis that you're putting in operation fighting the devil. So what do we do? In the lifestyle of faith, we make preparation in advance. We fill ourselves with the word of God. Why? Because out of the good a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. Let me say it this way. A man of faith, out of the faith he's placed in his heart, brings forth faith answers. Amen. And so if you're, you know, if you're going to face the devil, you're going to win the devil. And listen, you know, you, I mean, we, we got all kinds of statements, you know, we may. I mean, uh, Sambot used to call him Slewfoot. Yes! Oh, Slewfoot! Yeah, shout, yeah, somebody! You know, Brother Shambot. And how many ever heard Brother Shambot? How many ever heard him? Okay. All right, man. But Buddy Harrison said one time, he said he was the greatest preacher of faith he ever heard. Not teacher, but preacher of faith he ever heard. Because he could preach you in the faith. Hallelujah. You know, we call him Slewfoot. We, you know, we, 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 we kind of, listen, we make a lot of statements that inspire people. And it's okay to be inspired if you're building on top of that inspiration faith to get the job done. Now, um, growing up and down in eastern Carolina, I'm on this military thing, so we're just going to stay there. Is that all right? Because I believe it brings clarity. Well, I'm, from, I'm from Greenville. <clears throat> and uh, down from Greenville, if you go from Greenville down to the beach, you usually go down to Atlantic Beach, Moorhead City area. Because, you know, you go, through, go down through New Bern and go down uh, out that way. Well, on the way on, on Highway 70, going out to the beach, and you know, we have to go over to Kinston and get on 70 or whatever, was, um, was um, Cherry Point Marine Air Station. Okay? And, so, and then, of course, you had Camp Lejeune down on, near Jacksonville. And they would come in down that same area a lot of times just because they would come in the back way. Well, down at Atlantic Beach all the time, you had, a, you had a bunch of Marines down there all the time. I mean, you go out, you know, and of course, I, I, I had friends who would go down there and, on the weekends. And I had one guy I went to high school named Markham. Now, Markham was a juicer. I'm not talking about the Jack Lane fruit juicer. He was a juicer. He shot steroids. I mean, his neck was like this big around. He had legs like this. I mean, his skin was about torn from growing so fast. And Markham would get in fights with Marines all the time. And Markham was just crazy. I mean, you say football. He said, football. Who's football? He was playing football. I mean, he's just nuts. Love Markham. Markham was a great guy, but he was just a little on tilted. <laughs> anyway, hallelujah. But you got know, there's Marines. Been what, what? You'd have these, little, these Marines in there. They'd been in, they'd been in there with some sergeant in their face all week telling them how bad they were, how tough they were. And they go down to the beach looking for a fight. See, they were inspired. Okay? Now, a lot of times they weren't prepared to handle it. They, they, were in, they, they just got out of basic and showed up at Cherry Point or Camp Lejeune, you know, and, and they're, just, you know, they're just getting pumped up. You're bad. We're the ba greatest fighting force on the earth. I mean, you know, and they're going, yeah, you know, hoorah, hoorah. They're running kind of hoorah and all over the place. See, so that's inspiration. So we can preach inspiration, but we've got to give you equipping to go with your inspiration. Amen? So, now, those, a lot of those guys weren't just, just in the flesh, weren't big enough to handle it because they were those guys. But if you train them right and teach them right and inspire them and give them the weapons, they can go out and do stuff for the, for the country all over the world, and they are the great, the, you know, I mean, you want to see them coming. If you're in a bad place, you, you want to see you want to hear uh, on the shores of Tripoli or whatever, you know. I mean, you want to see that, that red banner coming with the Marines behind it. You want somebody like you want somebody like that showing up. Okay? Now, down at the beach by himself, he's just inspired. With the whole group, with his, all of his armor on, he's, he's, a, he's a fighting machine. And God says, put on the whole armor. Remember, Jesus says, put on the whole armor of God. So, we say a lot of things about the devil. Hey, he's a, you know, he's a defeated foe. Let me tell you something. He may be a defeated foe, but he'll clean your clock if you don't, if you don't handle him right. He'll whip your butt if you don't handle him right. So, you know, so don't, look, we can get inspired, but in our inspiration, let's get equipped. Let's get the word of God in us. Let's get all the, th the weapons of our warfare, which aren't carnal but mighty through God, equipped and on us, and know how to use them to our advantage so that when the devil does show up the evil day, he says here in Ephesians 6.10, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Well, how's that going to happen? That's a lifestyle. That's training. That's constant training. That's preparation. Amen. You know, it's, just, it's a funny thing. You know, muscle memory, I, you know, we talk about, in sports and athletics, we talk about muscle memory all the time now. You know, baseball players, they got to they take hundreds of pitches just to develop muscle memory. They call, it, they call it muscle memory, meaning that when you react, you're not cognitively thinking about 
doing this and rolling and doing your wrist or whatever. It's, you've done it so much that there's a, what they, call, they refer to as muscle memory. But you go three, four, five years and not swing a bat, and guess what? And I'll pick one up now. You know, Nathan was, Nathan, when Nathan was playing stuff, I'd pick one up or, you know, you know uh, help coach in summer ball, coach summer ball a few times, fall ball, and then uh, was assistant coach with him in JV in high school and stuff. And uh, you pick up a bat, and, and I used to play all the time. I was an all-star. I was an all-conference. I mean, I was a, a decent baseball player. It feels awkward because you haven't done and you, and you get And you, give, you go to swing, and somebody just get, get somebody to lob it into you, and you try to hit it, and you're, and you're off. It's just not there. Don't go into battle that way. Don't go into battle scratching your head about what is that scripture I need right here. Be, be active. Why? The just shall Come on. The just shall, come on, I want, I want that one word, real loud. The just shall live by faith. Not, not hit at it every once in a while. You know? Listen, if you ate, let me ask yourself this question. If I ate as often as I acted in faith, what would I look like? Would you be fat, skinny? Malnourished? Adam. Nathan's not here. Adam takes over. But honestly, I mean, do you live by faith? Now, most of us live to eat. I can tell you right now, most of you, you get up in the morning, you think about breakfast, and then about, about 11 o'clock, you're already planning what you're going to have for lunch. And then you're calling your wife or your husband and saying, what are we going to do for supper? One guy called his wife one time and said, uh, honey, what you making for dinner? She said, reservations. <laughs> Hallelujah. That went over some of y'all's heads. Anyway. Now, see, we think about it. Do we think about faith as much, living faith, feeding on the Word of God, fellowshipping with God, positioning ourselves into a lifestyle of that we live by faith? I'm not talking about, you know, I came out of the era where everybody had the, neg the confession beepers, you know, if you, you made a negative confession, five people cast the devil out of you and that kind of stuff. You know, they had a little beep, 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 beep. it's negative confession, do, 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 do. you know. And I, I, I'm being facetious here a little bit, but really that's how we were. I, mean, you, I wouldn't say that if I were you. Well, what would you say? I just I wouldn't say what you said. You know, we got their pet. You know, listen, I get the training ourselves and developing ourselves, but the, the bottom line comes to are you living by faith? Are you feeding on the Word of God? Are you meditating in His Word? Are you fellowshipping with God? Are you preparing yourself so that when the evil day comes, you're equipped to repel the attack? Now, let me say this. There is no temptation. We said this Sunday, there is no temptation taking you but such as common to man. But God will, with the temptation, make a way of escape. Meaning this, that you may be able to bear it. Remember, that you may be able to bear it, but bearing it didn't mean you put up with it. Bearing it was you were able to escape from it. You were able to overcome it. You were able to win. You were, not, you were not defeated by it. Christian, escape for a Christian is you never lose. Okay, you don't lose. You don't get crushed by it. You don't get defeated by it. You don't get ground into the ground and made, out, and made into powder. You win. You come out victorious. And so, like one guy said one time, he said, man, when you're going through hell, don't stop. Some folks get out and have a picnic basket and set up a camp and just live there and live in hell. Now, we don't need to do that. We need to get, you need to get out. I mean, when, you, when, you, when, when all hell is unleashed against you, you need to put the pedal to the metal and get on out of there. Instead of getting out and having a pity party about why gloom, despair, and agony, why did this happen to me, and how come God let this happen? And, you know, you, you, if you keep talking about the how comes and the shoulda, coulda, wouldas and the, and, and the getting out by some hook or crook, instead of speaking what God's Word says, you're going to be staying there for a while. But you can come out by speaking the Word of God. Amen. I remember one time we were in Tulsa. Now the girls weren't, none of the kids were born. This was pre, this was, actually, this was 80, this is 1982. This was a, a, a alumni, back, back in those days, 
uh, Raina had, had alumni week. We, we had a, 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 now it's, it's, it runs concurrent with Winter Bible Seminar. We have, they run our alumni week function with Winter Bible Seminar. But back then it was just a separate week. And so the, we had alumni week. And so, I mean, like 1982, Teal Osborne spoke. That's tough, isn't it? Have Dr. Osborne speaking at your alumni week. Kenneth Copeland. I still got the tapes, you know. I mean, Dr. Osborne, there with his, you know, going, wow, say that backwards, wow. <laughs> yeah, love Brother Osborne. But, you know, another man of faith who lived, went all over the world just living by faith, turning nations upside down for Jesus, praise God. I mean, back before the big crusades, he was holding crusades of 50, 60,000 people back in the 50s and, 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 and going in countries where you couldn't have an outdoor. Down in Mexico City, they had outdoor crusades of 50,000 people and weren't allowed to do it, but they did it anyway. You know, I mean, miracles, signs, and wonders for decades and decades. Hallelujah. Praise God. But we, we had gone back out to um, uh, Tulsa, Jamie and I. We, we drove out in my gremlin, demon-possessed car. Demon car, demon car. Had a little demon car. How many ever saw Grim Emperor's New Groove? Nobody in this room has seen the Emperor's New Groove. You've seen it. With the demon llama. Demon llama, demon. I had a demon car, demon car. I had an AMC Gremlin. Now, you go look up Gremlin, see the, the, the source, and get the descendants of Gremlins, and one of them is demon. And I had little Martian-looking dem, demons all over my car, and I had a demon in the windshield wipers. You turn the they were vacuum, they were vacuum windshield wipers. And you vacuum pump, and there's a hole in the line, and you turn it on, and it would go up one time and come back down. I drove to Tulsa from Little Rock, Arkansas to Tulsa, leaned up, Turning them on and off, on and off, on because we were in heavy rain. We get up on uh, the Muskogee Turnpike and get outside of Tulsa, and there's tornadoes all over the place. I mean, just you know, finally it passed off a little bit, so we got on the road. Tried to try those were turned over on the side on their sides because the wind had blown them over. You know, we get into Tulsa, and I was going to go see my friend Fawaz over. He lives in High Point, I mean Winston now, but he's still living in Tulsa. Janie, I were going to go see him before we got to the hotel and stuff, and we're driving down Sheraton. Uh, I actually memorial down to uh, 21st or whatever, and, and we're coming, we turn left on to 21st, and, and we're sitting there in traffic. Now, even though I had a demon car, I didn't want it crushed. I needed to get back home with that car, you know. I mean, maybe we should, maybe we should have gone around and, and, and taken all the little demons off. I mean, but they were cute demons. They had smiles on their face. Okay, anyway, you know, you know, we're sitting there, and here comes this big, not plastic, metal. Remember, you used to have all metal trash cans. Everybody had, had the metal trash cans, okay? Here comes this big trash can blowing down the street. I mean, the, the, the low-pressure system was still over Tulsa. I mean, signs are blowing out all over the place. And we're sitting there, and, and, and we're just sitting there. There's a car on here, and there's a car there. I, there's a stoplight. I can't go anywhere. And here it comes right at us. And it's not just tumbling down the street. Winds are high. It's, I mean, it's barreling down. And he gets out, oh, probably where, where, where the avenue out the kids are, and gets right in front of my car, and I go, in the name of Je Jesus. I didn't have to, now, Lord, you protect. You know, see, when you live by faith, you don't have time to think about what are you going to do in that moment. God is my witness. I am a witness, and my wife is a witness. That trash can came right up, moved over, went right behind my car, moved back over, and went down the street because there, no, there was nobody behind me. It just went, shoot, 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 shoot. And you kind of look in the mirror and you did that just happen? You just wonder, did that really just happen? Sometimes you surprise yourself. But see, when you live that way, <clears throat> when you think that way, when your mindset is that way, your first response is, oh, not, oh, dear Jesus, what are we going to do? It's in the name of Jesus, you got to move. Not what are we going to do, but you got to move. It did. And we just kind of sat down with each other for a minute. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. Got a testimony now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Got something to share one day. That just happened. I mean, it didn't hit the car beside us either. See, God don't just miss you and wreck somebody else. <laughs> you know, well, I got spared. <laughs> Killed 17 people in the bus over there. But I'm spared. <coughs> Amen. In that particular case, where I said the name of Jesus, now some, some other things can happen. Where God says, drop to the ground. He probably told everybody to drop to the ground in the Kenyan bombings, and they just didn't do it. When we live by faith, 
we see miracles. We see miracles because we have a mindset of faith. We ha- listen, if you have a mindset of faith, you have an expectancy that God is going to do supernatural things in your life. That when the bill comes, instead of, oh, dear God, what am I going to do? It's, oh, dear God, another chance to prove you out. It's not, Jesus, help me. It's, Jesus is my help. Amen. It's not, I need an answer. It's, I got an answer. See, it's just a shift. It's a paradigm shift. It's a shift from the mindset of unbelief and hopelessness to the mindset of I trust God that he will do what he said he would do. And he is my sustainer. He is the, my keeper. He's the glory and the lifter of my head. Glory to God. He keeps me from going under. He causes me to go over. I'm the head and not the tail. I go over only and not beneath. Glory to God. Why? Because God is God and there is none else. And when you begin to live that way, in the moments where it's not necessary, does that make sense? You're supposed to, but there's going to be times it's just not necessary to, to, you know, believe God for anything. There's, there's $500 in the bank and you need $20 to go get gas. There it is. You need to believe in God all the time. You need to exercise your faith all the time. Now, I'm not saying not, saying not necessary by biblical standards i'm saying not necessarily by mental standards it's when you don't have any money and you need gas and people get uptight oh god i gotta have gas where's it gonna come from same place it came from before you got to the place you didn't have any money in the bank god is your source say god's my source god's my answer god has an answer to everything i face nothing that comes my way what's this nothing that comes my way Say it again. Nothing that comes my way surprises God. Where is that, Bill? Is it Colossians? He knows that we have neither before we ask. Huh? Okay. (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, who knows where it is? It's, it's God knows what we have neither before we ask, before we even ask or think. Do we have a, concord, a walking concordance out there? Brother Bill's, know, he's what? Offline. Brother Bill's offline right now. <laughs> glory, glory, glory. I know, it's, I know the verse. This is not in my notes, and so... Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We looking it up anywhere, guys? I want, I want to give this out. I'm going to close with that as long as we, so if we can give that out. Huh? I, I can't hear her. Ephesians. Yep, there we go, Ephesians, thank you. 3, 20. Now, him that's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Amen. Do you know that if something shows up, God didn't get surprised? God already had the answer? God already had the answer before, he got, before you got in trouble? Before that trouble showed up, God already had the answer. I'm telling you, if David goes tomorrow to the throne of God and says, God, a $500 bill showed up that I wasn't expecting. God, don't fall off the throne. Go, oh, my God, I didn't know that was coming, David. I guess he wouldn't say, oh, my God. He'd say, oh, me. I didn't know that was coming, man. And look, I'm telling you right now, Copeland just wiped me out last night. I don't have anything to help you with. I mean, Copeland showed up and took $7 million out of here last night. I just don't have the 500 I don't know what we're going to do. That never happens. You're not going to show up to heaven 
and find the Father not knowing what was in need. Okay? He already knows. And let me say something. He's already made provision. So the lifestyle of faith, instead of coming and acting like God, didn't know what was going on. Father, I'm not really sure if you knew this or not. I know you've been busy with Brother Copeland and Brother Creflo and, and uh, you know, uh, different ones out there. They've been kind of coming up here and kind of getting money and doing all this kind of stuff. But, you know, I, I got this need, just in case you didn't know about it. So that's not faith. You know what that is? How come Copeland's getting all this stuff and I ain't getting nothing? That's really, it's just disguising it. It's disguised murmuring. You're hiding the murmuring. You're faking it. Instead of going there, Father! Hey, it's, it's Ed, your son. <laughs> now look, you know what you know what you're, you do before I knew it was coming, but here's the need, and I thank you that you meet my need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I just come to thank you. I come to, 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 to appropriate and to thank you that it's mine in Jesus' name. I have the answer because you already made provision, so I'm going to partake of the provision now. See, the lifestyle of faith goes in expecting to get, to get the need met instead of going in complaining about why it's not met. The big difference. One is faith and prayer. One is whining and complaining. Hello? And, and maybe we just need to start selling cheese at church if that's how you live. So you can have some cheese to go with your wine. Hello. Join the, the Christian Wine and Cheese Club. W-H-I-N-E. Are y'all here? You're going home. You need to stop. See how people, people start whining. Say, just, you want some wine? To go, you want some cheese to go with that wine? Because you're not, you listen, you're not, see, you're not living a lifestyle of faith Whining. I went to the Faith and Victory Church, and Pastor Ed stood up and called me a whiner. I ain't never going back there anymore because he was mean. Well, aren't you glad they didn't, the disciples didn't do that when Jesus said, Oh, ye of little faith. Hello? I bet they're glad. That was, he, he wasn't, stroking them and appeasing them and oh bless your darn hearts you, you one of these days you guys are gonna make some really cool apostles but you know right now you know you're under my grace and everything's just wonderful and leave it that way said, you, he says why is it you have so little faith oh ye of little faith i can imagine when he came came back down from the mount of transfiguration and they couldn't cast that one devil out so your disciples tried, and I, I, I can imagine the look he gave them. You ever had that look from somebody, somebody in authority in your life? You got that look? You don't like that look. Nobody likes that look. It's the look of, you, you get, y'all know what the look is? From a parent or from a teacher or, or, or an authority in your life? You get that look. They don't have to say anything. They don't have to call you a bozo, a pinhead. I don't have to say anything to you. They just look at you. And that look says, says Brother Hagin talked about that when he, he, one time he, he, uh, when the Lord was talking to him about, uh, you know, it said that he could do no mighty work. He said, if, they, if this hadn't happened, I, he said, if you hadn't, that's right, Brother Hagin uh, said, if you hadn't done something about that, I couldn't remember the demon appeared in the vision when he was talking to the Lord. And he went, yak, 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 yak. And, and when he finally said, in the name of Jesus, get out. And, and so finally the Lord said, if you hadn't done anything about that, I couldn't. I didn't hear you right, Lord. I, I know you said you wouldn't, didn't say you couldn't. He said three times. He said, when, he, when he came back on the third time, he said, I know you didn't say that. He said he looked at him. And he said the, the, his eyes like fire burning through him. I can imagine the Lord looking at his apostles or his future apostles and going, looking at them when they just couldn't cast that one little devil. You know? Shape up or ship out. Let's get, the, let's get it together. We got to stop being soft-skinned. And when we get corrected by the Word, let's be corrected and do what the Word says. Hey, you know what? You're right. So we can, why? Because it'll help you in the long run. How many, how many ever saw the movie, uh, at least the edited version on television, The Officer and a Gentleman? Officer and a Gentleman. And Richard Gere's in it with um, Lewis Gossett, Jr., 
And Gossett's is, is the, uh, the, the drill sergeant for boot camp. Now, here's the thing. When, when those guys come into officer candidate school and they start out, they're lower rank than the drill sergeant. On the day of graduation, they now outrank him. And so that he has to salute every one of them. Once they come by and they've received their, they received their bars or whatever, he has to salute them first because he's the lower-ranking officer. Because he's the NCO, he's a non-commissioned. They're commissioned officers. They're second Louis or junior J or junior grade. You can be second Louis or junior grade, depending on what branch. So Navy, I think, you usually call them JGs, junior grade. And um, so Greer goes with that whole movie, and this drill sergeant is kicking his butt and driving him in the ground. And, I mean, he, he hates him. He's ready to wash out. He fights. I mean, it's the whole movie. And then when he, he, he finally becomes a man in this thing, and he walks up and, and salute. He has to salute. The, the, gossip, the sergeant has to salute first, and Greer returns a salute. He's about in tears because he appreciates he understands at that point, at that point he appreciates that the correction and the, the chastisement and the discipline he went through was for his good. He, he understood that at that point. It took him, to, you know, and he, he, he understands that. He, that. That goes with them at that point. When the Word of God corrects you, you shouldn't get mad at the corrector. You should let the Word of God correct you. Because there's going to come a day you're going to be going, thank God that Pastor Ed shared that with me because it transformed my life. Or whoever's ministering, whoever, you know, I just happened to have been here, you know, and, and, and it slapped me a little bit. And it corrected me. And it said, shape up, you know, fish or cut bait. Get your act together, you know. See, you, you know, you, you know, we don't have to say all that. Just let the Word say it to you. The Word will say it to you. The Word will slap you sometimes. The just shall live by faith. Well, I don't, I don't have to get in the state of my Bible. You're going to have to. Hello? You have to grab yourself. Come on. Amen. Grab by the nap of the neck. Come on, boy. You're going. You're going. I don't want to go. You're going. Amen. Sit down here. I don't want to sit down. Sit down, I said. You've got to do what you've got to do. Control and bring yourself to where you're doing the things that bring you into a lifestyle of faith. Next week, we'll pick up here. <laughs> How far did you get? Point B of point one of ten. Hallelujah! Might be here next October.